Josh Lushba, Jenny Davis, Chikasha Micha, Micha Naholo Saya, Oklahoma Mitali. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, and I really want to thank the organizers for the invitation to be in conversation with you all. And a special thanks and shout out to Ruth Singer um, for her patience and persistence in uh, how slow I am to reply to email. So um, thank you all. And it's really good to be in conversation with you um, from across many time zones um, and, and geographic distance. Um, in terms of introducing myself, I am, um, as Ruth mentioned, a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. I am from um, what is now the state of Oklahoma within the United States. My community is originally from the southeastern part of the United States, and we were re relocated to Oklahoma um, in the 1800s. Um, I grew up there, and then um, for my master's and PhD, was trained in linguistics. I did a, a professional master's in language documentation and description. And then for my PhD training, um, was more within the realm of linguistic anthropology. And my undergrad training is in um, the humanities, actually. Um, in, in English and Spanish languages and literature. Um, and then I now work, uh, part of my appointment is in an anthropology department and the other part is in an American Indian Studies program. Um, and that's just to say that it's perhaps not surprising that the talk I am gonna give today is pulling on a lot of fields. And I think that I just um, always like to be both in conversation with a lot of fields, but learning from a lot of spaces. Um, I am joining, let me start my screen share here. And hopefully that is working correctly. Does that seem to be working? All right, um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about a couple of different frameworks that I find to be helpful as I'm thinking through the ethics of how we engage with um, uh, the kinds of language that we find within uh, archives and databases. I am joining the conversation um, today from Urbana, Illinois, um, which is the traditional territory and the treaty land of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Weya, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and to at the Southern Realm, Chickasaw Nations. Um, so this is a great map showing the overlap there. I think it's also important to recognize uh, that all of the nations that I mentioned were removed out of this state, um, most of which to Oklahoma where I grew up. Um, so I sit here uh, in a context where many of these tribal communities are no longer located, um, but it's still are still deeply connected. Um, this is also the ancestral land of many other groups that were not within that list and in a current context, um, home to indigenous people from throughout the hemisphere and the world. Um, and I believe Leslie said it was the practice to invite folks to um, indicate the land they are on and joining from, um, perhaps in chat. So um, I yeah. welcome. Thanks, welcome yeah, I'll just I've just put that up in chat. So if everybody could just say what country they're joining us from. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, I, I joke that it's a traditional practice, but um, I do want to give an earring acknowledgement statement um, <laughs> that is, uh, you know, the importance of earrings in Indigenous communities. Um, so these I wore especially today. They're from the Koori Circle there in Melbourne. Um, so uh, just in case anybody is wondering. Um, so my talk today and the things that I'm discussing, I wanna recognize that many of the specifics of what I'll bring up um, are from the context of the United States. And so my hope in sharing them is not to suggest that there's a universal approach to these things um, or that that would be even be appropriate or that the US is some kind of model to follow. I would you know, not be arguing that. Um, but rather, I'm hoping to be in conversation with aspects that apply more broadly and even to recognize the ones that don't. Um, and so I want to, you know, recognize where I'm coming from, not only because of um, the, the lands that I sit on and I'm talking from, but also to recognize um, that things are not uh, universal and, and acknowledge that. 
So I'd like to open my talk today with a quote from Nishinaabe scholar Leanne Simpson. In um, As We Have Always Done, her, um, one of her more recent books, she says, it became clear to me that how we live, how we organize, how we engage in the world, the process not only frames the outcome, it is the transformation. How molds and then gives birth to the present. The how changes us. How is the theoretical intervention? Um, and so uh, my talk today is really thinking about the how and it is an invitation for all of us to really marinate in the how and dig in and, and never necessarily um, leave. So how do we engage with archived collections and linguistic databases that were created within a different set of ethics than those that we now hold or when we do not know the ethics of how they were collected? How do we address the gaps between what may be considered the best practices currently or in a previous moment in a field of research and those held by the communities from Sorry. which the collection yeah, comes? A growing body of research addresses the options and strategies for collecting data or conducting think, research. Yeah. Just listening to it now. Uh, within indigenous communities in ways that are grounded in ethical practice framed under the rubrics of collaborative, engaged, activist, community-based, and indigenous methods, these discussions represent an exciting opportunity to move our fields away from the violent and colonial research methods established under historical and ongoing colonial frameworks. But they are largely limited to those who are actively doing language documentation and description work themselves. Um, in a largely unconnected field of practice, that of repatriation or rematriation in some areas um, of indigenous ancestral remains and indigenous material collections, guidelines have emerged that center and require consultation with native nations and descendant communities around access, research and display of collections from these communities. So today I wanna to bring together some of those best practices across collaborative research models for language documentation, consultation procedures and repatriation, and even data sovereignty models which require ongoing consent to propose ethics and strategies for our engaging with indigenous language databases and archival materials. And I wanna say that my presentation today is meant to be in conversation and in recognition of the incredible work that exists in our fields. And so in various moments, I have slides and these very text heavy slides that I'm happy to share um, with anyone and everyone, um, just as a way of acknowledging that these are um, areas where people have been working and thinking about these topics. I also wanna acknowledge that these, um, my thinking about this and the ways that I'm coming to them um, are also influenced by lots of folks um, within community, community scholars, um, family and kin, um, so that uh, what I'm saying today is not meant to be a kind of a, a sole practice or anything that I am proposing to have um, developed on my own, but rather in conversation with a lot of really incredible folks who are who are and have been thinking about this very deeply. Um, so I just have a couple of um, more recent examples of folks who have been talking about some of the things that we're thinking about, um, whether it's how do we indigenize and decolonize the field of linguistics, um, how do we think about things like data um, and language data, and um, how do we train folks within the field. So again, this is not extensive and it also uh, probably very clearly demonstrates a, a bias and conversation with folks here within the US um, and, and closely connected contexts. Um, so today I'm gonna start with a few key concepts and principles and then we'll build from there just to let you know how I approach these questions. Um, uh, first is that uh, from my perspective, ethics are always multiple. Um, these are multiple across um, field and institution, funding agencies, researcher, individuals, and communities. Um, so what is ethical to one group is not, our context is not autom automatically ethical to and in others. Um, and of course, when we think about things like um, all of these groups of folks, that there's a lot of variation even within a single context or a single group. 
Um, the second piece is that ethics change. Um, they, what is ethical in the past is not necessarily ethical now. We should anticipate that they will also change in the future. So um, in both of these cases, it's viewing ethics not as universal, not as kind of constant, but actually multiple changing. Um, and if we take that as our point of departure, then how do we address and operate in terms of ethics? And what, how do we um, think through the ethics of the work that we do? Um, and I think uh, we think about, you know, how the impact of research changes itself. Um, so past consent may not cover current and future implications and contexts of research. I think um, as anyone who has had to reevaluate their social media content or access settings um, when going on the job market or when members of the family join, right, I think we can all um, uh, understand that the way that information and um, research and even things like consent operate in the world changes and that that actually should be something that we're taking into consideration when we figure out and frame our ethics. Um, and lastly, that our ethics have to include the entire life and history of the data, the research and the people involved. Um, and I will get into this a little bit more in terms of thinking about um, uh, what it means to think about the life of the data itself or the, the materials themselves rather than starting from a point of kind of not having history or not having data. Um, and clearly this is uh, coming from conversations in decolonizing and indigenizing linguistics and related fields. Um, where one of the core principles is that our research methods dramatically shape who is welcome and willing to participate in our classrooms, our labs, our campuses, and our field. Um, and so I feel like if we're going to um, create a field that uh, invites and allows and even is a joyful experience for folks that have not and still aren't um, robustly represented, then one of the things we have to do is really look at our methods and our ethics. Um, and the other piece is something that I found myself saying more, um, more recently, and that is how we treat the pieces and parts of people, including language, is how we treat people as a whole. Um, and so if we want to think about how, um, particularly if we want to think about how Indigenous people experience linguistics um, and related fields, what one of the places that we look and understand how we'll be treated is how our languages are treated and vice versa. So um, I think those are kind of two helpful frameworks to have. Um, let's see, um, and so I think uh, one of the things that is uh, just a core underlying assumption of my argument today and in thinking about these things is that the practices that have created and continue to create linguistic databases and archives um, in any space that contain indigenous languages, cultures, and practices um, are not separate from other fields. Um, and not the least of which because linguistics um, is positioned kind of at the intersection of humanities and social sciences, computational and data sciences, cognitive and biological sciences, right? It has um, the conversations and draws from lots of fields. And in many cases, those partaking in the work of creating and using these databases, archives, and other collections of materials um, are the same people or working on the same grant in the same department or from the same university um, uh, as the, the kind of ideological frameworks and colonial context um, that we want to dismantle. So by engaging with the ways other academic fields and areas um, are thinking about ethics and decolonial practices, I believe linguistics can continue to develop its, our own best practices within the field and offer, and offer language attentive possibilities back to others. So as a bit of background, um, as I mentioned, I come to this conversation as someone who was trained in my um, master's and PhD and actually a postdoc um, in language documentation and description on the one hand and language revitalization and reclamation on the other. Um, so my work is primarily with language, really broadly defined um, with, with speakers, past, present, and future, and our allies. 
Um, and so I've been a part of a lot of conversations, um, community-based and institutional-based, um, and even uh, contexts like institutional review about the ethics related to individual consent during the collection of language and cultural data. Um, so when doing language documentation and description, um, of course, things like consent forms, right? And the explanation of what a research project um, is are really central to the conversation. And we, um, within the institutions here, have to submit applications for um, an internal institutional review. And then I also had to complete a tribal review for my research. And so the context of individual consent is actually a, a large piece of the conversation that I see um, uh, our field having and doing in a really robust way. Um, so again, these are just a few of the places where within language documentation and description, um, there have been conversations about how we can do that aspect of our work really collaboratively and in ways that um, consider community and bring in community in really good ways. Um, and I think they um, have really created some really wonderful models and examples of what a collaborative project would look like. So this is just a small screenshot um, or piece from the Leonard and Hayes article that I just um, referenced. And so um, we have models within linguistics to think about consent, to think about collaboration. Um, however, I would say that these conversations are not especially happening um, for those of us uh, who use and analyze language data um, that we have not created ourselves. So the conversation um, then creates a general assumption uh, that those who use linguistic materials and data that's already been collected don't have ethical considerations to consider, right? Um, so it's on the responsibility of the person who collected the data, to, who collected the materials to have done it in an ethical way. And then once they enter into that database or that archive, they become kind of ethically neutral. Um, and it's assumed that everything was done in a good way. Um, and again, uh, this is where that kind of multiplicity of ethics comes in. Um, and so what I find is that um, there's often a, te uh, a tendency for us as researchers to kind of opt out of the responsibility and ethics um, that we might be held to in other contexts. Um, and so these are some of the examples and, and frames that I have come across quite often um, in my own experience and in talking to others um, and in fact working with um, students who are trying to build their own practice and the advice that they've been given. Um, so one of the things that I see really um, the probably the most frequent frequently is that you know we didn't collect or create the collections. Um, so then you know the the ethics is on the person who collected them. Um, or we didn't do the analysis of the collections. Um, and so we are using data that came out of analysis, but we didn't do the analysis um, ourselves, right? So it's another layer of distance. Um, things like uh, the within a, especially a collaborative project or a team project, definitely a lab project, um, that there are too many different sources or co-authors to kind of investigate every component. So in comparative analysis, where you are drawing um, on a, a database that includes multiple languages and multiple um, contexts in which that data was collected, um, that's too much work, right? For us to be looking into how it was collected and, and under which ethics, and if we still uh, align ourselves with the ethics under which it was collected. Um, the fourth is that we don't know enough about when, where, or who the data come from or who the linguistic materials come from um, to think about or to address the ethics. And I will get um, uh, address that a little bit later when we think about the how helpful these types of contexts are for linguistic analysis. Um, and perhaps, you know, one of the main things for those of us working in institutions is that our research doesn't involve human subjects. Um, and I think there are a number of interventions there that we want to be thinking about um, and, and where indigenous and community based methods might uh, make some interventions, particularly in that fifth model. Um, so that model is coming from, again, a, a norm that says human subjects or human participation 
are the folks who are um, themselves individually contributing to a research project, um, but not a framing that says who is impacted by research itself. Um, and so that's a kind of misconnection often between the impact of research versus those who are participating in it. Um, and uh, for myself, I um, spend a lot of time as I travel around and go to different institutions in trying to find out what um, collections or what institutions have that's from my community. And I have done this for a very long time um, where, you know, I go to a uh, uh, an archive and various places and I museum big or small I always kind of type in and see what they might have of our community. Um, and as a result, I have found pieces of our language and our community in Chicago in Philadelphia in Spain. Um, and remembering my community is located in Oklahoma right so these are not places or spaces that we are necessarily frequenting um, and we didn't know about. Um, our language being held in those places up until that moment. And I often teach workshops and have conversations with indigenous folks about how we can find and liberate um, language materials from those places. Um, so this is a, a constant and kind of reoccurring issue for communities for whom identifying where our language materials and where our linguistic data even is in order to try to track it down or have access to that information. Um, so that's how I approach the um, indigenous component of this. Uh, I also am, I work within um, indigenous studies and American Indian studies, where again, we have really wonderful examples and models um, about how to do research in a decolonial way, how to not reproduce the kinds of things that we are, um, that are part of the histories of how they were created. And that includes recognizing, um, thinking about that human subjects component of research review, that that's not the definition that many indigenous communities give for when they would like to, um, how they define research that impacts them. So I have uh, an example of some of the ways different indigenous nations within my context, the US have defined research. Um, and one of the things that's really notable, so for example, um, this community that is just north and a little bit uh, west of me um, in their definitions of research, they include um, anything that uh, pertain to the community, right? So that includes description, databases, recording, um, and topics related to art and culture and linguistics. Um, and so if we take this from an indigenous perspective, one of the things we notice is that communities um, define this as within their purview of um, when a kind of community review should happen, of topics that are related to them, even if it isn't required to go through a human subjects review at an academic institution. Um, and so the next part of how I've been thinking about this, this is a kind of um, basic consent model where communities expect um, to be able to discuss um, how research is happening um, and if research is happening that includes members of their populations, um, but definitely not limited to that kind of research. Um, and so there are ways I think to carry that collaborative model that's coming out of language documentation and description, language revitalization work, these models of kind of single individual consent into our conversations about archives and databases. Um, and for that, I'd like to draw on the work that's happening within language revitalization, or not language revitalization, with repatriation um, and connect it to language revitalization work. Um, and so uh, a couple of things are necessary. As I've said, um, one of the things that I take for granted in this conversation and that I hope we are at a place where we all acknowledge is that archives and databases have been created through deeply colonial uh, processes. Um, 
Frequently, the histories of collecting and analyzing languages of the other within the US and other contexts um, are presented without mention of their emergence from or role in colonial and anti-Black structures of genocide, chattel slavery, containment, et cetera. Um, and so linguistics and linguistic anthropology emerged from those practices and so have the collections that we're talking about. And as a quick example, um, Franz Boas, who's often cited as the father of American anthropology and of linguistic anthropology as its practice within the US, um, is well known for advocating for the collection of linguistic and cultural materials. So most notably that triad of a dictionary, a grammar and a collection of texts um, for uh, he wanted for each native or indigenous community. Um, but what's less discussed is the fact that his practice also include digging up the ancestral remains, digging up graves of the same native communities he was into knowingly against their will. And so he had a practice of intentionally distracting them with various activities so that assist an assistant could go um, and, and violate burial sites. Um, and it, through that practice, he amassed a collection of over 300 um, skulls and the remains of an, another 150 native ancestors um, for the sole purpose of selling them to physical anthropologists and museums who would be doing the more biological anthropology side of things. Um, and he was also um, responsible for creating the um, human zoo component of the 1904 World's Fair. Um, and so I think for me, it's helpful to remember that even when we see a collection um, or archival materials or a database and we think, oh, this is probably collected through a different practice than some of the other practices that we often agree are, are unacceptable, right? Through the removal of ancestral remains, um, the removal of um, sacred and ceremonial objects and beings, um, when in fact it's the same folks, um, sometimes literally in the same fields that are doing it. Um, so linguistics and the practice of collecting language um, through documentation and description over the past 250 years and longer aren't separate from the histories and implications of other modes of collection. Um, and so in this realm, I have really benefited from reading uh, particularly like critical anti-imperial um, archival work and museum studies. Um, in which acknowledge and think through what archives are, what work they do in, um, in allowing and, and um, even upholding empire long after we think they might be doing that work. So this is um, one of the scholars that I often um, go to, Antoinette Burton, among others, who have been thinking about these things. Um, and so that's connected to the work of repatriation um, within a US context and I think others. Um, in particular, I have, um, you know, as indigenous folks, we don't ever really get to just be an indigenous person working on language in an institute um, or institution. We, we have to kind of uh, address and live in all of the areas and issues um, that impact us and our communities. Um, within the institution. And so in my context, um, in 2017, I discovered that um, my institution um, was not compliant, had um, still had approximately 800 indigenous ancestors um, that had not been repatriated. And as an indigenous person who lived in this space, who worked on this campus, um, it wasn't really something that I felt like I could say, oh, that's not my field. I can just go off and do this other thing. I work in languages, I don't have to worry about this. Um, and so in fact, I started getting training in um, the work of repatriation and particularly repatriation underneath or under um, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which was passed in 1990. Um, so within this law, which is uh, rather unique, it's, it's on the rarer side. Many nations do not have a kind of um, national level legislation that requires this type of work, um, but that's not to say that nations aren't doing repatriation or aren't doing aspects of this work. Um, and so this law requires um, institutions, any institution that has received federal funding, national funding, um, to 
create an inventory of the collections it holds that fall under certain categories to make those available in a national inventory um, and then to do the work of consultation um, around those um, collections. And so there are various things that I think are specific to these kinds of contexts. Obviously the work of working with ancestors and ancestral remains um, is uh, not the same thing as working with languages, but I will say that they are often deeply connected and I don't want to, um, I think as linguists, we appreciate the importance and power of language. And so we don't wanna diminish um, the, the importance and role uh, that it has for communities. Um, so there are a couple of things that I think are really interesting um, to think about NAGPRA or these kinds of practices of repatriation. One is that requirement of an inventory. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned, there are language materials from indigenous communities spread throughout a national context, throughout a global context. And for the most part, we don't know where they are. I think the majority of um, indigenous language materials are not accessible to communities um, and, and we don't know where they're circulating. And in fact, they're a lot more accessible to researchers and um, those affiliated with academic institutions than indigenous community members um, ourselves. And so I wonder what uh, inventory of um, indigenous language materials and data, a centralized singular place that all communities could go to and find out where our languages are being held and where those materials are stored um, digitally or in person and what those formats are. Um, I, you know, what, what would the power be of being able to see everywhere they're at and actually be able to make requests for them or to be able to go and visit um, and engage with those collections um, to be able to articulate the modes of access that we could be using or that we expect to be using. Um, in that context. And so um, I do think I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of what an inventory of indigenous languages um, and indigenous language materials would look like and what that would allow us to do, um, uh, again, in a kind of regional or national and even global context to see where everything is um, and, and, and who has it and how we can get it back. Um, so I think that is a place where us thinking about language from a kind of material framework and understanding that it is a, a thing, often a very material thing that is held in places that we don't, we don't have access to. How do we facilitate that kind of access um, for communities who have by all rights, um, right, should be able to access them and, and know where they're at. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting in terms of NAGPRA is that it requires consultation with native nations. Um, so rather than thinking about consent um, or operating on consultation at an individual level, this requires it to be a nation to nation um, kind of, or you know, at the community level, a formal arrangement with those organizational structures. Um, and it's supposed to happen before decisions are being made about those collections or individuals or those beings. Um, and it's, so it's connected and, and to um, recognition of indigenous sovereignty and the rights of communities to make decisions um, at the community level rather than at kind of separate individual levels. Um, it means working with the governments and representatives and structures of indigenous communities um, themselves and recognizing the kind of expertise that is held within communities um, and who, who has various responsibilities. And so sometimes that in the context of the US means that there's a designated person who would be a contact for these kinds of consultation, um, but it also includes and recognizes community experts and ceremonial leaders and other groups that a community might um, designate as the folks to do that kind of work and that kind of consultation. Um, I think uh, just an interesting component too that's happening um, within my own institution and then in some context is that uh, because there is so much work to do to get these collections, to consult with native nations, to make sure that everything is where it needs to be, there's a moratorium on research. Um, and so it's, um, you know, until we have it figured out better, 
Um, folks are not allowed to do research with these collections uh, because until we know more, it's impossible for people to do it in an ethical way. Um, and I think that that framework of um, not just kind of proceeding and hoping things get better down the road, but actually stopping and then figuring out how to do it in an ethical way before beginning again or before beginning um, is a really interesting uh, framework for us to consider as researchers, right? To start from a place um, of not how should I do it, but if I should do it and what that looks like. Um, and then very critically within the legal framework of NAGPRA within the US, and I think in many repatriation contexts, um, we often think of it as that actual physical return of things, right? The handing off of items. But what it actually refers to within the law is the transfer of control. Um, communities can decide for those collections to remain at an institution but they get to decide what the, what the types of care are, what the restriction of access is. And so I think um, thinking about that as a way of thinking about repatriation and what it means to return control of linguistics and language, um, linguistic collections and databases to those communities, um, regardless of how far in the past things have been collected. Um, and, and there were some interesting framings too in talking about repatriation that I think are um, quite relevant for us. One of the arguments, and I apologize for the citation not being here, but this is from Curtis 2011, I believe, um, in discussing repatriation within a Scottish context, um, is the argument that one of the shifts that's happened that allows and makes repatriation much more common now um, is a shift to viewing human remains as the remains of individuals um, rather than as samples of a larger population. And I think there's a degree to which I think we still talk about language um, data and information that we might find in language archives as representing a language um, and a linguistic group of people rather than thinking of it as representing individuals that have whose linguistic practices have been documented and captured in particular ways. Um, and so I think the humanization of linguistic data and linguistic materials is a key part of the process of us starting to think about our ethics and to think about how to connect and reconnect um, indigenous communities to these materials um, these are not arguments that you have to make to indigenous peoples. We have always um, known that our language was a part of our community and our identity um, and a part of humanity. Um, but I think the kind of framing of data within that scientific framework um, made it representative of an entire language, right? Rather than of an individual. And so I think the shift that's happening um, or that has happened within a kind of, um, in some context, museum or archeological um, framing, to some degree biological anthropology framing can be helpful for us as linguists to be mindful of when this is happening and what, how it shapes the work we do. And then I'll just give one um, kind of last example of things that I think um, are, are helpful. And that's to say in some part that there are folks who are thinking about these frameworks for how to do collaborative research, um, how to work with collections that have already been collected, and then how to work with the data that's generated from them in ethical ways um, in areas like genetics and genomics, which is not necessarily a place where we are um, encouraged or, or invited, I think, to be in conversation with, but I have found them to be really helpful, um, particularly because um, these authors and others um, emphasize the importance of getting approval from descendant communities. Um, and these folks are getting approval from descendant communities, even when there are thousands of years separating um, the studies, right, and, and the individuals or ancestors that are being, um, that might be included in a study. And so I think if we have archaeologists and, and geneticists um, who are advocating for this work, but also who are able to do it, the majority of our linguistics and language collections and archives were collected much more recently, right? And so this is an opportunity, it will be easier for us. And it's also, we don't 
we don't really have the excuse of it being too difficult because we can see examples of it being done um, in, in much uh, more, uh, in some ways, complex kinds of dynamics. Um, and so the other thing that has come out of these conversations, primarily in the genetics and genomics arena, um, is the conversation of data sovereignty. Um, so again, this is a response to two different areas of ways of thinking about data. One of them is a longstanding practice that views data um, as the property of whoever collected it or whoever assembled it into a database. I think we see plenty of examples of that in linguistics and linguistic anthropology. Um, whoever was the person to collect it or to assemble it um, is the person who has control over how it gets used and who has access to it. Um, and then, and to kind of combat that, there was a counter move that said, all data should be public, um, right? It should be universally accept, uh, accessible to counter this idea that it's being kind of hoarded in and by particular people in particular areas. And of course, um, the folks who have access and the ability to hoard that kind of information and control come from very uh, narrow and specific uh, demographic categories, for example. Um, so the ideas of public data and kind of universal access of data were meant to counter that um, and say, no, data should be available to everyone. This is a democratic approach. Um, and it, it also is a way of checking research to make sure that the analysis was done correctly, that it was done honestly, um, and so on. Um, but the indigenous sovereignty conversation, came, data sovereignty, came out of a different approach than either one of those and said, um, actually, you know, the people who should be making the decision about data should be the people that it comes from and should be the people who are impacted by um, that data. And so um, there, these are the conversations that are thinking about how governance can be applied for the creation, collection, and ownership of data by communities um, there are a number of terms that, again, I think come out of this conversation um, that just think about the right to um, have control over those decisions of how data is stored um, and what the implications are for who has access to it. Um, again, these are often thinking about it at the level of community. And so recognizing that an individual might consent to something or an individual might um, make a particular decision that impacts the community as a whole and impacts, I mean, in our context, um, like indigenous nations as a whole. And so whoever is implicated in it should have the opportunity and impacted by it should have the opportunity to discuss and have those, um, the actual decision-making power. And where I think we can kind of circle all the way back to the conversations of collaborative language documentation and description is that the framings of data governance are actually thinking about relationality. It's thinking about the conversations and continued relationships between people who are um, collecting data, the people data has been removed from, who the data have been removed from, um, and even um, who are impacted by research and how they can be in kind of constant conversation with the people who are doing research. And I'll, I'll give you the kind of terms that get thrown out um, in, in that context. But there have been some ways this has been integrated into discussions about linguistics itself. Um, so in a pretty recent um, paper by Gary Holton and Wesley Leonard and uh, Peter Pulsifer, um, there's a discussion about linguistic data and how this ethics impacts it. Um, and, and this um, talk about, right, the ethical relationship between languages and communities and prioritizing the community in those decisions um, and that ownership is not something that a researcher has over data, but rather the people from whom the um, data was taken. Um, and so the two terms that come in uh, in these conversations that come from, you know, often in a kind of biological framework or in a computational or data framework would be the idea of reconsent, um, where reconsent um, is not 
you know, you have consent when someone originally participates in a study, but actually that reconsent is required anytime a uh, anytime the research changes, even in small ways. Um, so this means that you have to get reconsent if there um, the data will be used to answer a different question. If the if other people other than the original folks participating in the as researchers are participating, um, so new people come on board, you have to have reconsent. Um, and so it's a con um, uh, connected to the practice that's also referred to as continuous consent. So you should always be checking in with communities and individuals to make sure they are still willing for the data and the recordings and the things that have come from their um, from themselves and their communities to be used. Um, and I think that both of these models are possible even when we're thinking about uh, databases and archives um, for which we weren't the folks who were collecting them. So I think if there is um, information in archives and databases from a community that we as researchers can be involved in what would essentially be a, a new consent process or a reconsenting process that says, you know, this was this was collected, we hope ethically, um, at least at the time or for the time, um, it, at some previous moment, um, but before we use it, we would like to get consent again, right? We would like to get specific consent to the things we're using them for. Um, we would like the communities to know not only that it exists, but that it's being used and how it's being used. Um, and so I think the idea of reconsent and continuous consent as a way to think about not treating the things we find in colonial archives and databases as just kind of free and available to us to use however we would like, but actually as opportunities to participate in these processes of reconsent and continuous consent. Um, and we can see lots of really important ways that um, the access to these kinds of archival materials and databases are used in communities around language reclamation. These are two brand new, um, well, more or less brand new pieces. Um, but of course, for everybody in the room, right, they're going to be familiar with Jackie Troy's work, um, probably with Wes Leonard's work, or even um, Megan Lukaniak, right? Lots of communities um, are able to do incredible things when we're allowed to um, reintegrate and reconnect with the kinds of things in archives and databases. Um, and uh, I would also say um, that uh, if that argument alone <laughs> isn't a good selling point, um, if the importance to community and recognizing the right of all people and especially indigenous peoples to um, control and, ha and consent to the ways that our languages and communities are used in research, I would also like to argue that um, those processes, the processes that I'm talking about, make our research stronger and more relevant. Um, so in conversations with community about the kinds of archives or databases, um, it's an opportunity to find out more about the collection. Um, I've worked with a lot of um, collections and archives that have very limited information um, about them and that it's, um, I'm sorry, that quote ended up on a, on a wrong slide there, but um, where am I going? Um, so that the um, ways that we, the things we know about language and um, the kinds of questions that we ask, or we find we get better, we do better research when those are in conversation with community, when we are listening to and valuing the kinds of expertise um, that communities bring about their own languages, about our own languages. Um, so it makes our research stronger. Um, and in contexts where we don't know enough uh, about um, a, a particular database or archive um, to reconnect with community, I would argue that we don't, we probably don't know enough for that database or material to be all that helpful for us in terms of the kinds of questions we want to ask as linguists. Um, we know that, uh, you know, there's very individual and societal variation, um, dialectal variation, change over time, right? So if we don't know, um, you know, beyond a, a sticky note that says this is Ojibwe, right? And we don't know which of the 
50 Ojibwe nations this is from, if we don't know who is the person providing it, when, where, how, right? I think we're actually, um, we can't address a lot of the questions that we would want to as linguists. And so um, understanding that the context, the more we learn more and we get more from these um, consenting and consultation and collaborative processes um, to answer the questions that are important, not just to linguists, but to communities themselves. Um, so, let's see, where is my mouse here? Sorry. Um, as a kind of rehash of the general things that I started with, um, I think one of the one of the takeaways for us is that no research is outside of responsibility of ethics, even if we didn't collect the material, um, even if it doesn't include working with live living humans. Um, in a context that an institution would require um, that uh, anything that in, is about or involves materials taken from indigenous communities should involve indigenous communities. Um, again, that ethics are multiple, that um, I think there's a tendency to see questioning ethics as questioning whether or not somebody is a good or bad person, when in fact, we should normalize conversations about how did you approach this? What were your priorities? Um, how did you answer these questions? What kind of consent model did you use? Um, so that we look at ethics as something that we're all constantly and continually negotiating um, and therefore able to ask questions about and invite people into those practices as well. Um, to think about consent as a continuative and ongoing process, not a one shot deal. Um, and so it's also necessary for materials that have already been collected, um, that it should include a, an entire life history of the data that we, when we come across things, we should be asking what ethics um, and what is the history of this material and, and how does that impact whether or not I'm going to engage with it and how. Um, and, and just kind of at a basic level that it's unethical for researchers to have access and to use archival and database um, and data if communities themselves don't have access, right? How are we continuing um, colonial frameworks by doing it? Um, and in fact, the majority of indigenous communities don't have access to those materials um, that have been taken and collected from them. Um, and so we have an obligation to be undoing that work in our own questions and inquiries about linguistics and indigenous languages. And I will end there. Chukmashki and here, okay. Um, I will stop the screen share unless somebody wants to see a particular slide. <laughs>